So, the other big lie, now before I start this, I want to remind people that this information that I'm giving is for educational purposes only. This is not to support any sort of ideology that puts one person or one group of people above or below any other individual or group of people. So, the other thing that you need to understand is there's another big lie, and that lie, and I dealt with this in my video on uh, Franz Boas and how Franz Boas destroyed anthropology and the social sciences in general. Uh, and that big lie is the fact that human breeds do not exist. Different breeds of human do not exist. Uh, and that's a lie. Okay, that's a stone-faced lie, okay? So, humans uh, are part of a family. They're a great ape, essentially. They're a humanoid. Primates diverged from other mammals about 85 million years ago, okay, in the late Cretaceous period, before Homo sapiens, or before the species, the, the Homos, there were other animals, Okay, and you can read this on your own. There's a lot of evidence, divergence of the human clade from the other great apes. Okay, so it's very, very, very well understood by scientists that human beings are an animal. They are an ape. This is, they're a real flesh and blood animal. Okay that really exists, and that really evolved, and that really diverged from other great apes. Okay? So, it's real. People really exist, and different groups of people really exist, and it's biologically measurable. Now, I'm using the term breed as opposed to race, because using the term race, uh, I believe is, uh, while it's acceptable, it's not as honest. So a breed is a specific group of domestic animals having a homogeneous appearance slash phenotype, uh, homogeneous behavior and or characteristics that distinguish it from other organisms of the same species. So what you have to understand is all groups of humans are of the human species, okay? However, there are different breeds of that human. And a breed is a group of domestic animals having a homogeneous appearance, okay? Homogeneous behavior and characteristics that distinguish it from other organisms of the same species. In literature, there exists several slightly deviating definitions Breeds are formed through genetic isolation and either natural adaptation to the environment or selective breeding. So, this is how the races of humanity evolved. You have genetic isolation through geog geographic isolation and natural adaptation to the environment and, and selective breeding. The only difference is in humans, the humans themselves were the ones participating in the selective breeding moving forward. This goes over everything you need to know about the human animal. So humans or modern humans, the most common and widespread species of primate, a great ape characterized by their hairless and their hairlessness and bipedalism. Okay, so the human being, the Homo sapien animal, is the most widespread species of primate, a great ape characterized by their hairlessness and bipedalism and high intelligence. Humans have a large brain and resulting cognitive skills that enable them to thrive in varied environments and develop complex societies and civilizations. Humans are highly social, and tend to live in complex social structures composed of many cooperating and competing groups, from families and kinship networks to political states as such. 
social interactions between humans have established a wide variety of values, social norms, languages, and rituals, each of which bolsters human society. The desire to understand and influence phenomenon has motivated humanity's development of science, technology, philosophy, mythology, religion, and other conceptual frameworks. This is a picture. They look like Peruvians of a man and a woman. I'm not sure if they're Peruvians. They're, no, they're Thai. They're Thai. Sorry. Okay. But that's what you got here. This is everything you need to know about the, the classification of the human being. You'll notice that it is of the order primate. It's a mammal. Okay. That is what you are as a human being. So... This is about race as a form of human categorization. You'll see why I prefer the word breed. Okay, race is a categorization of humans based on their shared physical or social qualities into groups generally viewed as distinct within a given society. The term came into common usage during the 16th century. By the 17th century, the term began to refer to physical phenotypical traits, uh, or pheno yeah, phenotypical traits, uh, and their later to national affiliations, modern science regard. And so keep this in mind. So-called modern science regards race as a social construct and identity, but we're going to see why it's not. So as I have pointed out, okay, as I have pointed out, there are things that you can hold and you can see and you can measure, and these are real things, okay? One of those things is race. Race is biological. Race is real. How do we know that? Okay, how do we know it's not a social construct? Well, the determination of race from skeleton through forensic anthropological methods. Metric and morphological techniques. So remember, a person's morphology is different enough from other people's morphology from uh, by their by their race is different enough to determine what race they are regardless of where they're born and regardless of what group they identify as okay it can be determined by measuring the skeletal structure of their body okay so Techniques at present of the oval window of the inner ear, which occurs more frequently in whites than in Native Americans, or the shape of the alveolar region, which distinguishes between Asian, African, and North American Indian groups. So these are techniques to distinguish different groups of people from other groups of people. A table of common cranial morphologic traits is presented. Metric techniques have been used to determine race from the skull, regression equations derived from measurements of the cranial base indicate 70 to 90% accuracy. So simply by measuring the cranial base, you can acquire 70 to 90% accuracy for classifying blacks and whites while multivariate discriminant uh, functions for discriminating blacks, whites, Native Americans correctly classify 82% of the males and 88% of the females. Okay? This is something that's real. Something that can be measured. Something that can be held, touched, carried. Okay? This really exists in space and time. This is not a theory to be argued. These are things that really exist. Okay, so, uh, reviewed techniques that, that not only distinguishes whites, blacks, and Native Americans, but also male Hispanics, Chinese, and Vietnamese. Platyes, synemia, femoral curvature, and other morphological attributes of the postcranial skeleton may be used to support of racial determination. Now, when you have somebody of a mixed ethnicity, such as a Hispanic, like a, a mestiza or a mestizo, sometimes 
Their skull may appear more Native American or more Caucasian, but their long bones may appear to be more Native American or Asian. Okay, so we're going to move forward here. So one of the things that I, this is about the historical skull collection and its use in forensic odontology uh, and anthropology. Now, what I want to point out here, real quickly. So the same people saying that race and gender are social constructs are the same people that encourage for diversity and inclusion of all people and all sexual orientations and all genders, etc. Now, if gender is a social construct, if race is a social construct, if these things are not really in existence, would this not make the whole concept of diversity completely a moot point? Because if men and women are exactly the same, why bother with diversity? Every man is a woman as much as they're a man, according to that. Or every white person is essentially a black person, or a black person, a white person, or Asian person, a Middle Eastern person, etc. Uh, because these are all social constructs, why would diversity matter? Why would it matter if we kept immigrants out of the United States versus letting them in? The people coming in would essentially be the same as the people living here because everything is a social construct. So diversity would therefore be a moot point, if you understand what I'm saying. But things are real. These things are biological. So the Institute of Forensic Medicine in Copenhagen houses a collection of historical skulls of unclear origin marked with general geographic or uh, racial descriptors. Okay, so not geographic per se, but racial descriptors. Would these historical skulls be of any value for the forensic on, uh, odontologist and anthropologist concerned with teaching and casework? We tried to clarify this question by blah, 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 program, yada, yada, yada. It was found that this historical collection does not show expected dental and ventral cranial traits in collection with the So these skulls do not actually accurately show that. However, as we see here, the determination of whether somebody is white, black, Asian, Native American, Hispanic, etc., or a male or female is quite easy utilizing the measurement of the skull and the long bones. Pilot study of assessment of racial affinity of Sri Lankan population using discriminant function statistics and a few established morphological racial traits. Results, discriminant functions developed to determine ancestry were used. In addition, blah, 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 blah. Five skulls had been measurements of blacks and another five had measurements of Native Americans. The rest had measurements of American whites. 24 skulls had medium. Now notice that says of American whites. Nasal openings, nasal root contour was low to moderate in height. In 22 skulls, nasal spine was small in 31 skulls, and nasal uh, still sill was blurred in 27 skulls. Conclusion, discriminant functions developed by the skulls in the study as belong to Caucasians, but see, this is the thing. What people don't understand is the, how we now define the race of people is by skull shape. So, what you need to take into consideration, white people, and we know this also through migrations, but so-called white people, people of the Caucasoid race, make up the people of Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Europe, the Americas to a large extent, Okay, as well as North Africa 
and Middle Eastern and Mediterranean countries. Those groups can be further subdivided into other breeds of people, and all of this can be shown with genetics. So discriminative functions develop, blah, 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 but only a few skulls had obvious Caucasian morphological traits. However, there were few skulls showing uh, clear negroid or, and mongoloid uh, morphological features. Finally, this study showed that the formula developed by Giles and Elliott can be used to differentiate Serang so it can be used to differentiate Sri Lankan skulls from those of American Indians. Okay, so it does show that this method of classifying skulls through metrics can differentiate skulls from Sri Lankans, Native Americans, and Blacks. Okay. So remember, they like to say that everybody's the same, everybody's the same, uh, diversity. Remember, if everybody's the same, diversity doesn't even exist, correct? Think about it. If everyone is the same, diversity is a social construct. It's a fake thing. If race doesn't exist, if gender doesn't exist, if religion doesn't exist, if culture doesn't exist, if none of these things exist, if none of these things come, have any genetic basis, well then, or, or biological basis, well then everything would just be a social construct. Gender, race, uh, everything. It's just a social construct. Borders. Okay. So, uh, results. We report new data on... So, this is the other thing. If everything is a social construct, why does it matter if you properly uh, assign the proper gender to the proper person at the proper time in the proper space, etc.? It shouldn't matter if it's a social construct, correct? People don't ask themselves these things. So, results. We report new data on 155 individuals, uh, four Tamil caste populations of South India, and perform comparative analysis with caste populations from the neighboring state of uh, Andhra Pradesh. Genetic differentiation among Tamil caste, blah, 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 it's low, reflecting largely common origin. Nonetheless, caste and continent specific patterns are evident, uh, blah, 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 blah. Genetic data from the Y chromosome also are in accord with blah, blah, blah. Okay, so they're in accord with what we know about northwest to southeast population movements in India. The population of ancient and historical population movements and caste social structure can be detected and replicated in South Indian caste populations from two different geographic regions. Okay, so they determined that Despite low, uh, low, it's not, it's a slight difference, but they have concluded it to confirm what they already know. The origins and genetic affinities of India's populations have been debated extensively. Archaeological studies document human occupation of the subcontinent from the Lower Paleolithic through the Neolithic, including a flourishing ancient civilization in the Indus Valley. The historical record documents an influx of Vedic Indo-European speaking immigrants into the northwest India, into northwest India, starting at 3,500 B.C. Okay. So, I'm sorry, 3,500 years ago. These immigrants spread southward and eastward into an existing agrarian society dominated by Dravidian speakers. With time, a more highly structured patriarchal caste system was developed. India is now broadly characterized by Indo-European speaking populations. Uh, found in the central and northern regions and by Dravidian speakers speaking uh, in the south and southeastern regions. Okay. So, a number of studies have addressed the genetic contribution of, a, of other Eurasian populations to the Indian caste and tribal populations. They have arrived at somewhat different conclusions regarding the origins of castes. Their relationship to each other, blah, 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 these disordinate, okay, whatever. 
So let's go, go, go. A broad study of 24 tests from various locations throughout India concluded that genetic data were not congruent with sociocultural affinities due to high rates of gene flow. Uh, but they're finding genetic differences, of course, or they wouldn't be able to prove that. Due to well-established clients, da, 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 we showed that genetic affinities between Indian castes from Tamil, uh, Tamil Nadu and other Eurasians are broadly congruent with patterns observed previously. So it's congruent with previously observed genetic research of the different castes. Results, la la la, you can read that. Uh, to further examine the potential of Western and Central Eurasian contributions to Southeastern, uh, South Indians' castes, mitochondrial U lineage, da, 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 genetic distances, the calculated genetic distance between Kamyol castes, Europeans, and East Asians, Y chromosome. What's so great about the genetic research is what they tried to say was that the uh, Indo-European blood in India was from the British colonization of the region. Uh, however, no, because we can now tell when that occurred. So genetic structure, the proportion of genetic variation distributed within and between South Indian castes was assessed. Da, 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 a similar value, difference with blah, 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 blah. Y chromosome, yada, yada, yada. They evaluated the correlation between caste rank and genetic distance using the men the Mantel test. Yada 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 discussion. Using a geographically well-defined sample of caste populations from Tamil Nadu, India, this study arrives at many conclusions similar to those from our previous studies of caste populations. Okay, in both cases there is extensive sharing of Y and M and mitochondrial DNA. Haplogroups, da, 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 da. Tamil castes of different rank have differential affinities to our sample of Europeans with upper caste demonstrating greater affinity than lower castes. Genetic distances are weakly correlated with caste rank. So keep that in mind. Genetic differences or distances are weakly correlated, but they are correlated with caste rank distances. Okay, this pattern argues for a differential contribution of male lineages to caste of different rank and limited male mobility between castes in South India because higher caste women are not marrying lower caste men, but higher caste men are marrying lower caste women. In a study of broadly distributed Indo-European and Dravidian caste, blah, 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 blah. A recent analysis of caste and tribal populations from eastern India demonstrated Indo-European influences on paternal caste lineage. Brahmins showed Y chromosome affinity to eastern Europeans. Remember, we talked about the uh, Aryan invasion. In contrast, maternal uh, DNA, uh, maternal uh, mitochondrial DNA polymorphisms revealed primarily Indian specific line lineages taken together. Uh, so this means that you have a lot of white guys getting it on with a lot of Indian women, essentially, in the past. So genetic variation between South Indian caste, blah, 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 in contrast, Tamil caste, yeah, duh. Okay, it shows the da, 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 neighboring states, okay, and I would encourage people to read this on their own. So what I want to show here, and I'm not going to read this out loud, but what I want to show here is that brain size and skull size, because you need a big skull to house a big brain, but it is correlated to a higher measurable IQ. Okay, that's just the facts. Again, this is something that can be measured. It can be seen, it can be touched, it can be felt, it can be held, it can be weighed, it can be measured. Okay, so brain size and IQ. Okay, it's a real thing. 
So if you admit this, so this is statistics show disparities between different groups of people. Uh, here's what the what that really means. So they're gonna bullshit you into what that really means, okay? But what you have to understand, it really does exist. However, if you're James Watson, the co-discoverer of DNA, you'll be told that belief in facts such as bigger brains possessed by people with bigger skulls correlate to higher IQs, generally speaking, you're going to be told you have odious attitudes about race, just like Ivar Giver uh, was told, you know, oh my God, he doesn't believe in our specific religion. Well, part of that religion, James Watson sinned against, and that sin was the sin of not believing in the status quo and believing that human beings, unlike other animals, are some sort of magical animal where brain size and brain shape and skull size does not have anything to do with IQ, okay, as measured.